Backfire from 1950 was an exciting crime mystery film about a World War II veteran who's trying to find a missing friend who the police believe is guilty of murder. It's an excellent film, and it stars Gordon McRae, Virginia Mayo, Edmund O'Brien, and a number of great actors. I really enjoyed this one. I'll summarize the film, and then I'll offer some closing thoughts. So the film opens up, and it's around Christmas time in the late 1940s. We have the character Bob Corey, who's played by actor Gordon McRae, who was an American soldier that was wounded at the end of World War II, and he's getting back surgery at a veterans hospital. And he's attended here by Nurse Julie, who's played by gorgeous actress Virginia Mayo. And we see that there's a little bit of a romance between the two of them. So Bob's military friend, Steve Connolly, shows up. He's played here by Edmund O'Brien, and they discuss their future plans to pool their money together so that they can get a ranch somewhere out in Arizona someday. So later there's some Christmas Eve festivities and Nurse Julie is there, you know, helping doing some of the decorating when she talks to Dr. Nolan. And hey, it's actor Charles Lane of Petticoat Junction, that pesky Mr. Bedlow, probably has another scheme in mind to shut down the cannonball. And yeah, I probably obscure references to Petticoat Junction aren't helping my review at all, so let's move on. So it's Christmas Eve, and as Bob is laying there in this semi-medicated state, it's the middle of the night, this mysterious woman with a Swedish accent appears and tells him that Steve has been in a terrible accident, that his back is broken, and he needs help. You must listen to me. Tell me what to do. Steve is hurt, badly hurt. Yeah, I know. The cliff. Cliff? There was no cliff. So Bob is in a heavily medicated state, tells her not to do anything and just to wait, and then drifts back to sleep again. Well, when he gets up later, he's really convinced that this was something that really happened, but nobody believes him. So he passes his medical examinations, and he's all good, and he gets checked out. And lucky guy, he's got a date with Nurse Julie. But as he's walking away from the hospital, he gets picked up by some police, and they bring him in for some questioning downtown to homicide and he's brought in to meet with captain garcia played by actor ed begley and it's here that he finds out that his friend steve is wanted for murder captain garcia explains that they are investigating the murder of gambler character solly blaine and steve is their main suspect so on the night that this guy was killed he and steve were arguing at his hotel solly was murdered and steve disappeared and they want to find him now, Bob is all like, no, 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 Steve is my friend. He wouldn't do that. He thinks it's all a mistake, and he's convinced that Steve is innocent. And he goes to do some investigating of his own. Say, Mac, uh, take me to the Fremont Hotel instead of the Biltmore. The Fremont? Yeah, yeah, I changed my mind. Brother, when you change it, you really change it. So he checks in at the Hotel Fremont, where Steve had been staying. The lady working there, Sybil, actress Ida Moore, talks to him and says that this Solly Blaine character would often visit Steve there and that on the day he was killed, he had been there and demanded 40000 that he was owed. Hmm. So she gives him a business card from a funeral home in Glendale. So Bob goes off and there he meets Ben Arno, played by actor Dane Clark. He's a great actor. I've seen in other crime films. And he is also an old war buddy of them. They catch up, and Bob mentions that he's looking for Steve. And Ben tells him that the last time he saw Steve was at a boxing match. And we cut over to a flashback of Steve in the ring fighting. And you know, I had to laugh watching this, as the last film I reviewed, The Admiral Was a Lady, also featured a doughy Edmund O'Brien in a boxing ring getting clobbered. And, well, here he is again <laughs> in a ring, and yes, he's getting clobbered and knocked out. Well, Ben meets with him after the fight and offers him a job working with him in his mortuary business. But Steve turns it down, and that, we find out from Ben, was the last time that he had seen him. So we cut to Bob on a date with Julie, and Bob is all distracted about this case, and Julie suggests they go and talk with Mrs. Blaine, who is the widow 
of the guy who was shot. So sure enough, they go meet with Mrs. Blaine. She's played by actress Frances Robinson, and they talk to her. And she tells them about what happened. And we go to another flashback about the time that her husband had won $40,000. We see the character Solly, played by actor Richard Rober, and he's at his home, and his dog starts barking at something outside. Uh-oh. So Bob heads back to his hotel and decides to check the phone logs. And it takes a little bribery of the hotel clerk. It's played here by David Hoffman. He's one of those great actors with a very distinctive face. And I remember him as the face in the crystal ball at the beginning of The Frozen Ghost with Lon Chaney Jr. Even you can commit murder. Yeah, well, anyhow, so Bob calls one of the numbers and he reaches a woman and he kind of pretends to be Steve on the call. The girl on the phone unintentionally reveals that Steve apparently had a girlfriend named Liza Radoff. Hmm. So Bob's able to get the address of an apartment in Hollywood and takes a cab over there, finds a key to kind of sneakily let himself in. So he's in this Liza's apartment when her roommate Bonnie comes home. Now Bob just sort of pretends to be waiting for Liza to return. Now Bonnie's very friendly with him and tells about how Steve and Liza met and you got it, another flashback. So Steve had been working for a local gambler whose girlfriend was Liza. And one night, Steve went to a nightclub to pick her up to bring her to a party, and Bonnie joined them. And it was at this gambling party that Steve met and got friendly with Liza as she was playing on the piano. And of course, in Hollywood style, the two fall in love. Steve, I love you. I've never said that to anyone else. So Bob realizes that it was Liza who was the mysterious woman who had visited him early in the film when he was at the hospital. He decides to sneak away, and Bonnie, seeing his gone, is puzzled, but then sort of shrugs it off and heads back to the kitchen when she's shot. Wow, this film has so many twists and turns. What's going on? Well, it's back to Captain Garcia again, who is interrogating Steve and Julie and some other people, and he's angry that the shooting happened. But he gets a lead from ballistics that the same kind of bullet that killed Bonnie also was used to kill Solly. So the detectives find out that a Chinese man, Lee Kwong, had been shot, and he's claiming that he has information on Steve. So they all gather around this poor guy lying in a hospital bed, and he goes to another flashback, recounting the details of how he worked for gambler Lou Walsh at his house. Now, even though Liza was his sweetheart, Steve had been hired as a bodyguard there, and of course, the romance between the two of them just continued to grow. So the two of them are planning to just run off together, but wouldn't you know it, as Steve is out by the garage, one near a very steep driveway, this mysterious person from the shadows secretly releases the brake from a car, causing it to roll down into Steve and crushing him against a wall. So Kwong says that at this point he fled downtown, but then he was gunned down, which leads us to where we are now at the hospital. And he's really not doing well, and he fades away. There's a great line from the doctor here, by the way. He says, the next person he'll talk to will be one of his ancestors. So now Julie has a hunch and contacts Mrs. Blaine for the name of the doctor who had treated her husband. And she gets the name of the doctor. So Julie dons her nurse's outfit and goes sneaking into this doctor's office late at night, pretending to be a nurse. She asks the janitor to let her into the office, and wouldn't you know it, the doctor soon arrives, finds Steve's file, and attempts to burn it while Julie's hiding. But he discovers Julie, and, you know, she can't get away from him, and she tells him that Steve was actually a victim of an attempted murder. So the doctor locks her in a room and then calls up Bob, telling him where Steve can be found, but... Wouldn't you know it, there's that shadowy figure arriving, and the doctor pleads not to be shot, but too late. Well, Julie is released minutes later by the janitor, and Bob now knows where to go to find Steve. But you know what? With only 10 minutes left in this film, I can't give away the big reveal of the film. So no spoilers here, but you have to catch the exciting end for yourself. So some closing thoughts and insights on this film. Backfire was released in 1950, it was produced by Warner Brothers, 
and directed by Vincent Sherman, who also directed, among other things, The Return of Dr. X with Humphrey Bogart. Man, that film was weird. He also directed Errol Flynn and the Adventures of Don Juan in 48, which is on my list to check out soon. Like many crime films of this era, I love how the mystery is slowly revealed, largely through a series of flashbacks from different character perspectives. Keeps it very interesting, with the film directed mainly from the perspective of this character, Bob, who wants to get to the bottom of the mystery of the disappearance of his friend. I love films like this because we're the ones getting to see things unravel, piece by piece. And I know it's not really breaking any new ground here with the mystery genre, but I just love this format personally. And I like the idea of Edmund O'Brien's character as the MacGuffin of the film, basically, this is who everybody's looking for. This is the big mystery we want revealed. And I also love the theme of military friendships and the bonds that form. So it's after the war, but we still have that dedication and loyalty that these guys have for one another. It's the driving force of the narrative that largely the Steve character is a friend that Bob is looking for. And he's so consumed by it for crying out loud, that even when he's having dinner with Virginia Mayo, he seems preoccupied. And that's really saying something. I thought that Gordon McRae was great in the lead here. You know, he did Broadway musicals and started in cinema in the late 1940s. And of course, he's best known for musicals like Oklahoma from the 50s. And I thought he was really good and convincing here as this character driven to research the disappearance of his friend. And again, that element of old friends from the war helping out one another. I thought was just great here. And it's interesting, too, that briefly in this film, the character Bonnie was played by Sheila McRae, who was Gord McRae's real-life wife. It's kind of neat. I also thought it was noteworthy seeing Vivica Linsfers as the very lovely and mysterious character, Liza. And I couldn't help but pick up uh, Ingrid Bergman vibe from her character. Now, what's so interesting to me is that I remember her, of all things, from the film Stargate from 1995, which is one of my all-time favorite science fiction films. Now, in that film, she's much older. She's the patron who's supporting James Spader's character who is researching the Stargate. So it's neat to see her here in a younger role as well. Now, alas, even though my hero, Edmund O'Brien, is in this film, he really doesn't feature very prominently in the movie. Honestly, he's sort of the MacGuffin of the film with everybody looking for him and not many appearances. The ones that do appear are mostly in flashbacks. But still, it's a crime film, and it's got Edmund O'Brien, so you know it's one that I'm going to recommend. And of course, Virginia Mayo is beautiful in this film. I've seen her before in other films like White Heat from 1949, where she played opposite of James Cagney as the sneaky, conniving wife, and it was so good. You know, it's, it's funny, as I do these reviews and I try to research a little bit more, I love looking at the movie posters <laughs> and how they have her front and center. I mean, understandably, she was a big actress at the time, but with descriptions like, that white heat girl brings all her fire to backfire. <laughs> well, honestly, yeah, she's in the film, and she's quite lovely, of course, but there really wasn't a lot of romantic fire in this film. I mean, yes, there were a couple kisses, but honestly, this was more of a story-driven crime narrative. You know, so the posters maybe aren't being completely honest with us, you know. A double cross that doubled back with a blonde at the end of it all. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess so. But just don't judge this film by the posters, okay? And a final note, there was some very nice, if brief, location footage in the film as well. You know, my three fans know that I love this kind of thing. And there were scenes that were filmed at the Birmingham Veterans Hospital, also City Hall in Los Angeles, as well as the Fremont and Biltmore Hotels in downtown Los Angeles. I just love seeing those old locations in these films. Backfire from 1950, it was an excellent crime film. I enjoyed the acting. I thought the story was fantastic and how the mystery slowly unfolded. And I just think it's a great film. It's really one worth checking out. Thanks for watching. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a wonderful feeling. 
everything's going my way. Ah! <laughs>